This is the story of roots reggae music and the Rastafarian movement as told by the musicians and people who brought it to the world. On April 21st, 1966, His Imperial Majesty, Emperor Haile Selassie I of Ethiopia, visited Jamaica. For many, it was the genesis of a revolution. Fear joyfulness. We have five days of fear joyfulness. The freedom that Rastafarian had and the joy, you know, the king and you know, it was a no energy man. I remember that man. Pure vibration of love and togetherness and fullness, man. It's wonderful, I am. Something was there, something, something happens there, you know what I mean? It just feel it. It was a joy. It was a huge and happy day for Rasta man. I never see so much Rasta in my life. People lying in the street all the way up and Rasta parents all over. Elders and everybody could come out beating drums and everything. Now you think it was like, it's like the first Jamaican people really see so much Rasta parents. They didn't know that so much Rasta was in Jamaica. Yeah, man. Powerful day, man. Powerful day, my brother. Powerful day, man. The most powerful day that I know. Their music, you have all different kind of music, but this music is for their music. The suffering people music, within the music, they find the strength of the Almighty, who is always there for them. It's more than just singing or chanting or what, what you know, it's a spiritual awakening. It's like a revival, like it comes to a church. The rhythm and the message became one in the same. There was a time that it was one in the same. It's a message in music message you know the lyrics is spiritual so it's a poor man's music it's rasta music coming from the slums all these guys you see the sufferers in the music build them right up to a stack up yeah i play rebel music Any music has something to do with human bloodline. I love to listen to it. Because that is what society try to destroy. The keeper of the earth, which is man. The cry of the people is for the people, you know. That very important music, you know. Music is from beginning, man. Half of the songs of Solomon until this day, man. Music is a part of righteousness. The throne of God is a manifestation of God. And all we talk about is God. It's life. Music. Singing. It's life. It's, it's in everyone. You know, only you, only you can put it out. You find it within yourself and you put it out, put it out, put it out. You know, It's a long story.
If we should begin from a spiritual point of view, then I would hereby mention Jamaica. A more quieter place to be found would be heaven itself. One of the nice peace havens on earth, a land of tranquility, I suppose. Greetings from the Rastafari brethren, still domiciled on this former slave plantation island, Jamaica. Jamaica is an island in the Caribbean, so-called Caribbean, because we were carried beyond our borders, not by free will, but by force. We are the slaves descended from the African race, the African race, the African race. We are the slaves descended from the African race. We are proud to know this race. Our forefathers were taken away, taken away, taken away. They were bound in ships and shackled on the way, like baggage and brought to the way. We hear that Christopher Columbus discovered Jamaica, discovered Jamaica, discovered Jamaica. But as far as we hear again, he said that the island was established before Columbus came here. Well, as you know, the first people of Jamaica was the Arawak Indians. They were people who, they were not really warified people. They were not warified people. They were more just, they were there. So when Christopher Columbus had come and said, and discover the place. You can't discover a place where people already live there. You had the Caribs also, which was coming from islands to islands all over the Caribbean. Then after that, you know that the Spanish people came here and they were the one that really invaded the islands and killed off majority of the Indians that was living here. From here to Cuba, all over the Caribbean, it was about six million people. Then after that, you know, the British came and they invaded the Spaniards. That's why even the first um, capital of Jamaica was, was Spanish town, which we, we call at that time the St. Diego de la Vega. Well, I think slavery was abolished 1838. But well, before the first slave masters we had were, I think it was the Spanish. So they came and saw the Indians and enslaved the Indians for a period because the Indians weren't so strong as us. So they started bringing the strong guys from Africa, which was I and I. We never know where we have come. Slaves were taken from all different parts in Africa. And them they have a gate, a personal gate in Ghana where them ship all the slaves them from. Yes, Jamaica is this powerful little island which has taken away from slave children, as I discover, from Africa. I don't have to discover that the world begin in Africa. But we have come to the Ashanti part of Africa. Ghana. We used to call it the Middle Passage thing, where slaves like my father and forefathers, great grandfathers and great great fathers used to jump off of the boat. No man would love to be in captivity, and no man feel good in captivity. So 
you know those days was a very miserable days for those slaves you know and and you know i, I feel it for them all it was just a greed power take over this land take over that the land take over that the land and we run things because them now have the power of um the superior weaponry like me so they must die Europeans were very arrogant and selfish. Very selfish. Because they came into Africa and they were fed. They were fed and they were educated. And for that love, they offered hate. 400 years of colonial reign has brought the people misery, has left us much pain. But here we are today sitting right here in this veranda, eh? bringing you the message of peace and love. God is love. Love is God. And all who love it is a job of sacrifice. 400 years of colonial reign has brought the people misery it has left them such pain the talk is now of independence, you see. Seems it was meant for you or for me. Maroons were the untamed, literally untamed. They were the people who escaped from the docks when the slave ships came into the north coast of Jamaica. And they ran away to the district of Look Behind, so-called because they ran back to back, so someone was always looking to see if they were being followed and how closely, and the other one was always finding a way into the wilderness of what they call the cockpit country, which is unique on the planet and in highly endangered now by mining interests. And it, it's pocked with these saucer and bowl-sized indentations and, and razor-sharp edges. And these are barefoot slaves escaping from a slave ship running through this to get away from the authorities. And they, they were such fierce fighters that they fought the British off to a detente where the British couldn't afford to lose any more men. And they struck a deal where they were given a, a portion of land that was theirs outside the territory of Jamaica, that was extraterritorial, that they had total control over as a way of establishing a peace. And that treaty has never been abrogated. It exists to these days. They are self-governing. Well, I speak with the, of the Maroon with a kind of mixed feeling, you know? Because one, they keep up the, the African culture still in Jamaica. You know, they, if you go to Maroon country, so the African thing and thing and thing. But history about them, as they will like it, you know. Because I hear that the English could beat them because they always could hide in the cockpit country. So the British made a treaty to them and say, well, you see, if any slave run away, you owe them for us and them thing there. And they did them things there. Yeah, Maroon gave up a lot of slaves to the British, you know. Because they were trying to buy out their freedom too. So they would compromise with the British by giving up certain slaves. There's two poles with the Maroons, and I'm not here one of that glorified by a lot of things that the Maroons did. Because right away you took the size of the colonial power in order for you to keep your freedom, but you did not help to fight for the majority of the blacks in order for them to get their freedom. We get different stories because some people say the Maroons were like sympathizers to the white men in that they gave them jobs to catch the runaway slaves. That's what we heard, you know. And then some people check the Maroons as rebels, you know, to the system. Well, I think they're one of the best culture here. I mean, I respect them so much. They, they managed to uh, hold on on the culture. They managed to dig in Babylon, but they live, still live out. They managed to to have their own law and their own system. I respect them a lot, my brethren, but God, it's what I want to hear. Their influence is disproportionate. 
and they are res highly respected, especially those who have maintained their hardcore blackness. We have the Maroon spirit, and those look a Maroon spirit from those time, from the historical time in Africa. Even in this no time, it lives on, even within our music. There's many, many islands in the West Indies, as I know, but Jamaica is kind of special. For instance, this set of Jamaican are this little set of Africans that they take from Ashanti, set of Ghana in the jungle there, is a set of rebellious Africans. I and I, four parents, were very strong. We were one of the, the earliest people who got with freedom to how we acted and rebelled against all the British, uh, you know, we couldn't take it. And you have to remember that after slavery too, was so-called abolish, and so-called emancipation was coming to fulfillment. Um, the slaves was not given anything, but the slave masters and their families was given over 40 million pounds in for compensation for losing their slaves. So basically it was more for the upper class. These people were left with nothing, really. No land for themselves, nothing. So people had nowhere to go, really. I think um, most of the Africans that was in slavery wanted was to keep the heritage of their ancestors from Africa. But there was also a fight against the um, aristocrats or the colonial society that it was mandatory that black people in a whole should not congregate on their own. It was like they had to congregate with the parson or the clergy in the church and they had to be taught English and they had to be Christianized. And that, to me, that is where we lost a lot of our powers as such because not having your own culture, not knowing about your own ancestors, I think that it really makes up the minds of the black people. I speak Hamari, my sister speaks Swahili, they put us both together now, that's why we can't understand, that's why we can't understand, we are the slave descendants from the African race, the African race, the African race, we are the slave descendants from the African race. After emancipation, then we come to independence. And since independence, it was a glorious period for all of us. You know, the whole skies were filled with fireworks, and freedom is a good thing. Any nation who seek a form of independence, or even so called independence, they say, well, why? Something good to happen now, we're independent now, blah, blah, blah. It was like a a standard of, hey, we have our own independence now. Britain rule us no more. You know, we can 
rule ourselves and take care of ourselves. 1962, that's when they said we were independent. But to be independent, it is not nice for us. That we don't like to talk about independent. It's like we are independent. So it, it was a scan, independent, to the people. For even the society speak it also. That's it. We don't have no independence because them don't give us no freedom. We know we don't really have that independence, independence like they told us. Because Governor General is the highest figure in Jamaica. And the Governor General works for the Queen in England. He don't work for Jamaica government. So England still controls Jamaica. Nothing can be done without you go to the Privy Council in England or you, you go to the Governor General to open the Parliament. Well, that's a big champion. How can a country independent and have a Governor General? It's crazy. Independence, you know. It's crazy. That's a bullshit. As Rastafarians, we look at it that the independence was basically for the upper class getting independent from England to control these people here in Jamaica. So I do think that independence was to me was like, yeah, we have a flag now. We have this, but we are still manipulated and controlled and influenced by the ways of Europe, especially England. When you're young, you know, the excitement and the, the fireworks and them thing there. So them thing that to me, independence was just like, it's not now like that what I know now what independence is. I know that that type of independence is not a real foundation thing. Independence don't mean dependency. It means independence. So independence, as I say, for us is, at them time, there was like a great thing. So it's important to be independent. It's very important, especially when you have to take care of people. We have to pray more and be able to sit deep within. Because as I'm saying, I'm saying, where there is no vision, as it is written in the Bible, the people perish. I shall come back, or in death, even to serve you as I served before. In life I shall be the same, in death I shall be a terror. To the if death has power, then come to me to be the real mark of Gabby I would like to be. If I may come in an earthquake, or a plague, or a pestilence, or a God would have me, then be assured that I shall never desert you and make your enemies triumph over you. For I shall live in the physical or the spiritual to see the day of Africa's glory. When I am dead, wrap the mantle of the red, the black and the green around me, for in the new life I shall rise up first with God's strength and blessing to lead the millions up the heights and the triumph that you well know. Look for me in a world when I are a storm. Look for me all around you, for with God's grace I shall come back with countless millions of black men and women who have died in America, those who have died in the West Indies, and those who have died in Africa to aid you in the fight for liberty, freedom, and life. Part of the allure of Marcus Garvey to this day is his extreme eloquence, the, the match of any orator of the 20th century, and the fact that he was a very proud black Jamaican man gives strength and courage to the hearts of people to this day. born in St. Anne. And he go home and he read, 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 never stop read. Hide and read, hide and read, he never stop read. But he was too smart, he was a printer. 
That's why I know. And that's, that's where you get his knowledge. We have one little man now from down a sentence. So these people need to go back to the land. Where them come from. This Marcus guy will start the foundation for the movement of Back to Africa. And so he had what you call him, UNIA, Universal Negro Improvement Association. Hello, citizens of Africa. I greet you in the name of the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League of the World. You may ask, what organization is that? It is for me to inform you that the Universal Negro Improvement Association is an organization that seeks to unite into one solid body, the 400 million Negroes of the world, for the purpose of bettering our industrial, commercial, educational, social, and political conditions. We try to get people together and let people know that Africa is the homeland, the motherland, and a lot of people never even realize that, because they used to fight him and curse him, bring police to break up his meeting and beat his followers. And he was pursuing the powers to be that people who are desirous of going to Africa should be given a chance to do that. Those desirous. When I started here in Jamaica and the government did refuse him here. Then after he was, you know, turned against here in Jamaica, he went to America, of course, and then he started to do the same thing that he was doing from here in Jamaica and showing them about Africa and how they can unify themselves. Marcus Garvey was so great that he leave Jamaica and go in America and do great, great works there. He scared the hell out of the American government because he had a couple of million people in uniform. They used to march from Harlem down to Herald Square on 34th Street. Imagine that. In the 1920s, black people in uniform marching downtown New York. Whoa. He rallied the people and he had several ships on the Black Star Line. And he decided he got some land in Liberia. Against odds, you know, he had great odds. The first ship Marcus Garvey by. I'm selling my ship, I couldn't see it. <laughs> Why may I tell you, say, Marcus got you something, you know? The second ship, it was a seaworthy need. Third one, make one trip to the Caribbean, and then when it come back, uh, I'm charge Marcus Garvey and lock him up. So they infiltrated his organization and one of his chief lieutenants, who uh, was involved in a lot of the seeming corruption, um, undermined him for the FBI and for this guy's boss, J. Edgar Hoover. And Garvey was on these charges that he had nothing to do with, put in jail. He did jail time in Jamaica. He was hounded, but an inspiration through all of this. And he never wavered. They always put all kind of trumped up charge on Marcus Garvey. You know, when a prophet is before his time, he bear a lot of prosecution because of arrogance and ignorance. You know what I mean? I would imagine the people who did that, they wouldn't do it today. Because, you know, people learn. Yes, we all learn. But Marcus Garvey was such a strong spirit within us, our movement. We have to defend him. Many people would be impertinent enough to ask me, who am I to say that Marcus Garvey should have got more respect? Yes, he was disrespected because if he was not being disrespected, then he would not reach in prison, endorsed by the politicians of the past. But many people would think it was like a color question much, no? It was more worthwhile to be thought of as a question of respecting who the people are, what they are, what they stand for. Where are they heading? And what they were at present, or uh, at the time. We are men, human beings, capable of the same acts as any other race. 
possessing under fair circumstances the same intelligence as any other race. Now Africa's been sleeping, not dead, only sleeping. Today Africa's walking around not only on her feet, but on her brains. You can enslave as was done for 300 years the bodies of men. You can shackle the hands of men. You can shackle the feet of men. You can imprison the bodies of men, but you cannot shackle or imprison the minds of men. plant the seed because he taught the people of whole lot of ethics and self-pride. My deal with the light of the people to uplift them, you know, centralize the mind of them and organize the spirit of them. That's why his organization was known as the Universal Negro Improvement Association. Because it was to lift them. Marcus Garvey let you know that, hey, if you don't know about your ancestors, if you don't know where you're coming from, you don't know where you're at, and you don't know where you intend to go. If you don't have your own language, you don't have your own God, then you can't have your own culture, and then you won't be a race. And if you don't have those things, then you're like a dying tree without any roots. If the white man say, this God is white, he said, I can't vex with him. I'm not vex with him. But when me, the black man, say, my God is black, you not for vex with me neither. You feel allowed that. That's the way me see my God. So it's a whole fullness. Yes, in my show, he said, it's one God. of color are created in the image of God. Now from this premise follow the equality of all men and the brotherhood of all men. We have found a new ideal because whilst our God has no color and yet it is human to see everything through one's own spectacles and since the white people have seen their God through their white spectacles we have only now started to see our God through our own spectacles. We believe in the God of Ethiopia, the everlasting God, God of Father, God of Son, God of Holy Ghost, the one God of all ages. That is the God in whom we believe, but we shall worship him through the spectacles of Ethiopia. Ethiopia shall stretch forth our hands unto God, and princes shall come out of Egypt. Because <laughs> classes, nations, races have been quite quiet for over four centuries. Who was merely born abuse, insult, humiliation. Whose forbearance can only be compared to the prophet Job, has likewise lifted his bowed head and raised it up to God's skies and cried out, I am a man and demand a man's chance and a man's treatment in this world. To Rasta, we think that Marcus Garb was like another John the Baptist within this time, because he came and prophesied a lot of things that would take place. Marcus Garb come as a forerunner, many of us would say, as a forerunner. Just like how I said, John the Baptist come before the Father. Marcus Garvey mean like John the Baptist to Rasta. You know, like you read in the Bible about Jesus and John the Baptist, and John the Baptist tell you about, say, when you see that man named Jesus come, that will be the Almighty. Well, Marcus Garvey did that. Is Marcus Garvey John the Baptist in the sense of someone who foretells and, and, and comes to prepare the world and, and spreads the message? In other words, uh, a modern anchor man. I think there's a case to be made for that, yeah. He had an interesting life. He was a brilliant orator, writer. Um, he, he was the Martin Luther King of his time. Marcus Garvey is like a good shepherd that gave his life for his sheep. Marcus Garvey was a prophet, still is a prophet. A lot of Marcus Garvey's words and work is still here. Kind of a reggae music he really is. He's the first man, really, in Jamaica that really show anyone any signs of Rasta or towards Rasta, you know, because Marcus Garvey was the first man who really introduced the red, gold, and green flag in Jamaica. And Marcus Garvey was the first man who tried to make Jamaicans look up to the king. Marcus Garvey was the one who said 
When a king is crowned in the north, worship him as your God and king. He made the first song that we sing as a people out here that rally us to Ethiopia. It says, Ethiopia, the land of our forefathers, the land we are all God's love to be. As swift bees to hive suddenly gather, so thy children are gathered to thee. Thy voice through the dim past has spoken. Ethiopia shall stretch forth her hands. By thee shall all barriers be broken. Heaven is our dear father's land. Advance, advance to victory. Let Africa be free. To advance with truth and right. To advance with love and light. With righteousness leading, we hail and we shout ye the song. Humanity leading. One God for us all. The Bible speaks of King of Kings, Lord of Lords, can come to the land of the tribe of Judah. Right? Only one man can really build that crown. His Imperial Majesty is the King of all kings. None before, none to come, and none after. Speaking about the last year again, they speak about the power of the Holy Trinity. When you hear those words, the power of the Holy Trinity, what more you want to know? I mean, you, I mean what more people want to know? The power of the Holy Trinity. I mean, that's it. His Imperial Majesty was and is the 225th reigning monarch of the Solomonic dynasty and the 134th Christian king. You have a king and you have a king, but one king rule them all. There is a land far, far away. There's no night, there's only day. Look into the book of life and you will see that there's a land far, far away. In 1930, in the East African nation of Ethiopia, Haile Selassie was crowned Emperor King of Kings, the Lion of Judah. According to legend, this proud emperor was a direct descendant of Solomon and Sheba. He was the emperor of Ethiopia, spent more than 40 years as the emperor. And as the crown prince, altogether is 50 years. I myself personally spent with him 14 years. 
I know him as his private secretary or advisor. He was a very good person, a very good leader, a very good ecclesiastical person. From his ancestors, from the royal family, and they made him as a crown prince. At that time, was called Safari, Ras Safari. Then, when he became emperor, he preferred to be called by his baptismal name, Haile Selassie, means the power of Holy Trinity. Italy stood poised to invade Ethiopia under the leadership of a would-be Caesar, Benito Mussolini. Il Duce's intentions were clear. And in Geneva, the League of Nations met to consider the plight of the small African kingdom, then one of only two independent nations on the dark continent. To the spokesman of the member nations, the threat was grave, not only to Ethiopian freedom, but to the very peace of the world. Faced with the threat of League boycott, Mussolini nonetheless massed his legions and without even a declaration of war, rolled across the Ethiopian frontier into the mountain fastnesses of Haile Selassie's kingdom. The most highly mobilized war machine of the day, was on the move. Ethiopia was one of the only countries that has never been colonized during the days when they were sharing up the lands in Africa. One of the main reasons because Ethiopia itself is on a plateau. And Addis Ababa especially means it is on a high plateau. So most invaders that came there, they had a hard time to conquer that area. So they leave it out. Today in Addis Ababa, without a warning, out of the north zoom two giant Italian bombers. Begin to drop ominous missiles. Fearing deadly gas bombs, the panic-stricken natives frantically plug their noses with eucalyptus leaves as primitive gas masks. Italy come, fight down, burn up all our Wilba priests with pies and gases and all them over there and try to run it to Wopia. Driving for his goal of empire, Mussolini has made history. Four years ago, Ethiopia, unconquered in 2,000 years, was a sovereign kingdom. Mussolini, he invaded Ethiopia, all right, and His Majesty went to the League of Nations to ask them for assistance. But when Ethiopia's fugitive emperor comes to plead for his conquered people, Italian enemies tear him down. Again, the League does nothing, and Ethiopia is a closed instrument. He was crying, asking the assistance from the League of Nations. But no one accepted him. Then he said, if you didn't accept my proposal and my question, the history and God will remember your work. This fire today is for Ethiopia. But next time we'll burn it all over the world. And it become, as he said, he said, what must I go back and tell my defense system? As a member of the league. God and history shall recall your judgment. If you don't bow by free will, you bow by force. We find it necessary to say, as it was written, the Son of God goes forth to war, a kingly crown to wear, whose blood red banner streams of all who follow in his trade. We need no coward in our band who are afraid to die. We call for valiant-hearted men who look like men of war. Until the philosophy which hold one race superior and another inferior is finally and permanently discredited and abandoned 
everywhere is war. It's a war that until they're no longer first class and second class citizens of any nation. Until the color of a man's skin is of no more significance than the color of his eyes. a war that until the basic human rights are equally guaranteed to all without regard to race. And it's a war that until that day the dream of lasting peace, world citizenship, rule of international morality, will remain in but a fleeting illusion to be pursued, but never attained. Now everywhere is war. Conquering Lion of Judah became that in fact as Haile Selassie, with the help of the British, regained his throne in Ethiopia. Thus died the empire hopes of Hitler's stooge, Il Duce. Still prevail because Ethiopia has never been controlled by no outside government you know, for too long. I think the Italians were the only people who had the opportunity to go in and occupy for a short period. Still they had to move out. Finally, when the Italians were captured, His Majesty came and the Ethiopians wanted to kill them. The captured soldier said, No, feed these people and send them home. His Majesty just come out and speak over the radio to all of them and send it on to the fields. And what he say? He say, we shall not render evil for evil, but we shall show them that we are humane people with humane hearts. We shall let them rebuild the cities that they have destroyed. Do them no harm. Don't do them any harm. And everyone starts saying, what kind of leader is this? That even his enemies will forgive them. Actions like those don't come from common men. Actions like those after your enemy has robbed you, raped you, taking your money, and then you still turn around and say, can you just get along? Ladies and gentlemen, I know I speak in behalf of all of my fellow Americans in welcoming His Imperial Majesty back to the United States. In welcoming His Majesty, we honor not only a distinguished leader of his country and a distinguished world figure, but we also welcome a man whose place in history is already assured. His memorable and distinctive appearance before the League of Nations in the mid-30s, which so stirred the conscience of the world, that appearance was supported prior to that by action and has been supported in its high hopes by the consistent support which His Imperial Majesty has given 
to those efforts since the end of the Second War to associate the three nations together in common enterprises. Therefore, for what he has done in his own country, his efforts to move his country forward and provide a better life for its people, and his efforts uh, throughout the world, which stretch back uh, over 30 or 40 years, for all of this, uh, Your Majesty, we take the greatest pride in welcoming you here. You do us honor, and I can assure you that there is no guest that we will receive in this country that will give uh, a greater sense of livelier pride and satisfaction to the American people than your presence here today. Your Majesty, you're most welcome. Is the Myself know that Emperor Ian Selassie is the return Messiah. He is the one that Revelation, you took your Bible, if you have a Bible right now, you read Revelation 5. And Revelation 5 bring attention to me and to others. Because it was written, and I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written. And on the back side was sealed with seven seals. And I heard an angel proclaiming with a loud voice. Who is worthy to open the book and to lose the seven seals thereof? I'm saying no man was found worthy to open the book and to read the book or even to look on the book. So John sat as a cry. And he said, one of the four and twenty elders said unto him, Why are you crying? Weep not. Behold the land of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, which art prevailed to open the book and to lose the seven seals thereof. Well, within this time, and within this real modernistical world that we are into in this dispensation of time, revelation fulfilled itself upon one individual. One cannot underestimate the importance of Haile Selassie's visit to Jamaica in April of 1966. Hundreds of thousands of people came out physically to see him. He was, in many people's minds, a returned God incarnate coming to bless his people. And he did turn the tables on the Jamaican government, which paid for the trip, to disabuse the Jamaican people of the notion that he was somehow God Almighty himself. And when he met privately with Rastafarian elders, the report came back that he had said to them, I am who you say I am, I am who you say. So I wasn't there. I don't know. But this is what they were saying. Ja, Rastafari, give it and read the yards of my night. Ja, Almighty I. Just a passing glance was all I had of Rastafari face. Just a passing glance was all I had. Oh yes. 
This is a little island that is here in Malaysia, ja, Rastafari, landed, Celestia. You can have to come in there because it's not just historical. Prophecy are fulfilled spiritually. Because Jah just bring the freedom. Rastafari come from the mountains everywhere to come see His Majesty. It was a joy, the road, like line with people, school people, everybody. Boy, that was an energy, man. I, I feel so I still tremble. You know, I don't know why. The emotion over me. That I said, this little man, man, look on him. He's so small, you know what I mean? And powerful, you know what I mean? And it was a different atmosphere. The whole island rejoiced to see him. But it was like a miracle to Rasta, man, when the emperor come here. The same when Slash I come, I see earthquake. I see whirlwind. Real win when I'm come. I take a straight look on this man, you know. And trust me. It's like him just said to me in my eyes when him look for me, like him say, You you don't believe, but sooner or later you're gonna believe, you know. It's like that him said to me. But I see a little man at the window a little with two youth beside him, you know, and him point on me so and touch you them and show show. You know, point and show me and wave to me, you know? And wave to my man is like, him wave in the spirit in my brethren, you know? That's, it's like, you know, sissy the, 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 the almighty that. Well, the feeling that I have, it really lives on until now because the song, Passing Glance, come from that. So that feeling that live on from that time until this time and will ever live on. It was the genesis of a revolution to bring an evolution. Wisdom is like when you drop a pebble in the water and the ripples flow. So the ripples flow and it came and I, I got it. It take me years to reveal it. It take me years to feel it. It take me years to know it. But I get it. And the seed grow, and the seed grow. Yes, man, tell him multiply now like the sons of the seashore, my people have to survive, man. Rastafari, man. <laughs> Let God arise and let all his enemies be scattered. Let all them that hate him flee. As smoke is driven away, so drive him away. As wax melts before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. But let the righteous be glad. Yea, let him make seasonary rejoice before God. He must sing unto God and sing songs of praise and extol him that riddle upon the heavens by his name, Jah, and rejoice before him. When I say Jah, I say Jehovah. So it's a sacred name. You know what I mean? Appealing to the Almighty One. It's Jah I pray to. And to me, in you know myself, every part of my structure, nobody else knows about Jah. Jah is the creator. And I would say his imperial majesty is Jah. The Bible was there as our guiding part. So when we look and we see the king crowned, king of kings, lord of lords, conquering line of the tribe of Judah. As the Bible said, the nations that are all beasts. They have one mind. They shall wage war with the lamb, but the lamb shall overcome, for he's king of kings and Lord of Lords, and they that are with him are called faithful and chosen. And Rasta read that in the Bible, and they see the King of Kings come in Ethiopia, sitting on the real throne of Israel from Moses' time. He 
You understand me? And that's why we look for this man and say, yeah, this is the Christ that come back. And even the scripture tell you that the new Christ shall be coming out of the line of David, out of the line of David. So with Queen of Sheba and King Solomon, it is straight up there coming straight from David. Till I say, to I, me the only savior. And we prophesy that his majesty is the Lion of Judah as recorded in the Revelations, King of Kings, Psalm 1930. And as far as we are concerned, he is our Messiah. There were people, Howell, Hibbert, Dunkley, others involved as street preachers beginning as early as 1912 in Kingston, preaching a return of a black divinity as a king. And then 15 and 16 and 1920, working right up until 1930 when Selassie was crowned. And that was recognized by a lot of people who'd heard these preachers for the previous at least 18 years. These people recognized this was the person who had been predicted. Rasta really, to me, started from way back into the late 20s and 30s. You know, early 30s, late 20s. The coronation of his majesty was a stimulus that motivated people like Leonard Howell. Howell was the first Rasta man. Leonard Howell from Pinnacle. He's the man who established Rasta Far in Jamaica. Leonard Howell was even before the 1930. You understand? But when 1930 come on, this is when his coronation and then him speak from that. But when he went and he saw the whole of that, he was he was inspired. So, in Jamaica, is there an issue that we think your man named Owell really start spreading the doctrine of Rastafari in time? Over the years, it built gradually. In those days, we hardly heard about this last That time, the knowledge just had come, you know. Rasta started from here in Kingston. Especially in a place they usually call named Bakawal. That is down off Darling Street where they build a place where they call Kibali Gardens now. You have a lot of elder Rasta parents was there. A lot of them was also in Dunkirk. And they started to preach the word of Rastafari. Right? They usually educate people about it and so forth. But some of them want to tell you about Bakawal. Some of them tell you about Shantytown. And as I say back then in old days, it's the same from the ghetto of Sligoville, that's where oil was. All of the movements we've seen bridging and things were from Sligoville. So it's a way of survival back then for the people. That's where Rasta spring from. Stone that the builder refused shall be a cornerstone one day. The stone that the builder refused shall be the head Rastas in Jamaica, although we are, they, they say we are Jamaican African people, we move a different way from the ordinary people. Yeah. For in the 50s and 60s, it's like coming up, in, from the 30s then, coming up. Rasta don't get no support from the government of Jamaica. None at all. All those hellers, they were all cast, but it was like the worst thing ever. Rasta wasn't really popular in Jamaica, you know. Rasta was looked down on in those times because they really wanted to see him necktie and Chris white shirt and your suit and your shoes shine like glass, you see what I mean? They've been through a struggle. I mean, tribulations, not just a struggle, tribulations. Now, everywhere they live, they had to move because the government would move them or the church would come down on them. Sometimes they walk on the streets and the church would call the police on them. We'd have to go somewhere into the woods, hiding from police. You have to hide from it because once the police get you, you're going to get some big beating and kick with some big boots and end up to jail too. Where police usually hold Rastafarians and use batten to beat off their nuts. 
they carry around scissors with them and they trim off the hair because it was a law. You know, and sometimes there was a law that passed that you shoot Rasta first and ask questions after. Lock him up if he smokes a spliff. Give him 18 months to three years. You had certain Rasta man. You didn't see them. They used to have to live in the hills, hiding. Because there was this myth, or people used to spread the story that um, now many young children were being taken away. And they used to say, it's the black art man that were taking the children. Black Rasta is love, no black art man not taking no children to do nothing. Or how would that just stop suddenly? It was risky then to even be yourself and a person even have a glimpse of who you are. If you are not going to church or whatever it may be, you are being called black heart and the rest of it. You see the Rasta man them now them start here and, and oil and them start here about Rastafari and start rebel against the society now. So some of them do wear them rebel now, him just start wear all crocus bag, him never bother wear shoes again or nothing, the kind of rebel against the system now and say, when it's wicked, I don't even want to take part out, I don't even want to use no soap, I don't even want to use this. You know them way they? I do rebel in them when they hear the truth, you know. Even though they usually hold Rasta and trim Rasta, Rasta walk in gullies and bushes and still keep their nuts. They didn't care if they even get to go to no supermarket or anywhere. They stay in the bushes, cultivate, eat them food, do what they have to do and still keep their nuts. But you have some Rastas now who are always militant, venturing out and say, boy, we're not going to stop, fight until they leave us alone. No matter how the so-called status quo always try to bring us down, Rasta always keeps strong. Because we always have said the hattle, the battle, are the sweet of the victory. Lord, my people want to be free. Just like the blind would like to see. But the heart of the battle will be. The sweet of the victory. Anytime you see Rasta say, Babylon, you know what that means? A problem. And then you see Babylon, you see prison, you see jail, you see workhouse, you see hanging, you see death. You see the society that becomes Babylon is the system of the world. The system of the world is just like a cesspool of corruption. Because it rules, divide and conquer the people. This is a chaos society. Nobody will realize this dangerous place. They have been fight and driven back, back against the wall. They say, chains have been removed from your feet, but it's replaced by money. Jingle, 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 jingle. Jing. So you're still hearing the sound of the chain. It's only that it's not on your feet. It's now in your pocket. Right now, there's a whole lot of fragments of Babylon and fragments of the Roman Empire still live here. Who are seeking power to try to rule. But all this went crumble. You know what I mean? Because the line of the tribe of Judah had prevailed. To open the book and lose the seal. The rule in righteousness. Weep not, my brethren. We know that all wickedness shall fall, really. You still have a fight until the day of harvest. Who knows? But there must be an end to all evil. I don't believe in a violence. You see what I mean? I man believe in peace. Yeah, and the only way to beat this system is in a peaceful way still. Well, if you overcome the ways of Babylon, if you just have a strong mind and a relationship within yourself, we just have to walk wisely and live with wisdom. So if you reason out something, then it's like you're more seeking for the truth. But if you're going to come with your opinion and impose it on me and say, because I think that if this is the way it should be, then I think that your oppressor has been fire for you and Babylonian. You know, so we don't use a literal fire to throw on you or use a gun. So what we do, we use the music. The reggae music, culture music is the biggest weapon right now. Biggest weapon. 
we have in this country here. And it's the only weapon we think we have. Legal weapon. <laughs> yeah, we have another weapon, but it's illegal. And I don't want a drone, I prefer to use a drone. Yeah. We have enough other ways, you know, where a man can use to stop this friend. But, you know, my tool for get the people together is music. <laughs> Rasta emerged from its seedling grounds in, in the hills, Warika especially, above Kingston. A lot of criminals, a lot of fugitives, a lot of long-haired, freaky Rasta Blackheart men come to eat your children, so the popular myth went. And a couple of things happened. One, one was the civil rights struggle in America, which found voice uh, in the pre-independence years in, in Jamaica right through the 60s, 70s too for that matter, and the, the music, the music which carried the message. The music was a part of Jamaican culture from the people, it's history from the Maroons coming all along from drumming to reggae sound. It continued to improve and integrate along the way. The transformations that happened in the last century, largely due to its destination as a, a tourist refuge. So musicians were trained in a, in a British way with Western instruments and taught to play any number of styles of music to appeal to Germans and French and British, certainly, because the British still owned it. And at the same time, up in the hills, the Poco Maniacs <laughs> and the uh, Buru drummers were keeping alive, I guess it's a shanti, isn't it? It's Ghanaian rhythm, ultimately. There is a case to be made for reggae's rhythm to go back to late 19th century Ghana. Out of all those influences and, and right up into Trinidadian Calypso merging into a slightly different form called Mento in, in Jamaica, you, you have the drumbeat of resistance. And those men up in the hills in Count Ossie's camp and the origins of the Scatolites membership, 50s, beating the drum, raining hellfire on Babylon, urging redemption beginning with liberation from Britain. And suddenly in 1962, bath, there it is, they're free. And these people are now in the studios making double time music, militant music when you think of it, you know, scat, 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 scat. It's like a, a run with a full backpack and basic training. Yeah, 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 yeah. The sky set was created by Jamaicans with a fusion of blues and jazz. All right? That's how you got the scat. We're just more happy music up there. So everyone was happy. Scat, 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 yeah, happy, yeah, yeah. You know, even though you're broke, you're happy. And they were from the dispossessed part of society, and they were beginning to break through. And the big 
stands uptown like the near white Byron Lee and the Dragon Airs. We're aping this music and taking it internationally. But the real stuff going on in Jamaica was what morphed into Rocksteady, which was deceptively slow for a couple of years, but began to become very conscious in its lyrics. Then they came with a Rocksteady now. The Rocksteady came with a more sentimental, romantic type of thing. Because the music was lower down and more smooth, and a man was just singing about mostly girls and sex and so forth. But after a while now, when the reggae started to emerge, is when the rude boy reggae started to come into touch now. And that was like late 60s now. And then in 68, you get the full beat per minute, heartbeat rhythm of reggae music. But the root boy reggae now, Rasta changed it different now. Instead of doing root boy reggae, root because they fused the ska and the rock set together to bring a kind of medium pace music. So instead I just lay back so all the way like rock steady, it more in between. And instead I go like jump with like ska, it get in between ska and rock steady. So you have this type of feel, but it was more of a militant feel. It was more protested. Most thing about sociological and economical and political and cultural happenings. And the secret of reggae is that it is the beat of the healthy human heart at rest. So it's irresistible even if you don't understand that thick patchwork. There's something visceral about it. And that's the secret at the heart of reggae's appeal around the world. That's why when you go into the world, a lot of people think that Jamaica, if they don't look on the map, they think Jamaica is a huge country. But it's a small country with a set of people that have big hearts. end of the 50s, early 60s, when Bob was in Trenchtown, it was a desirable place for the underclass to rise to. Uh, people who were living in tin shacks now actually had cement walls around them and a communal kitchen and a, a rather communally oriented group of people. If one person had enough money to eat, then that little tenement yard ate that night. And it was understood that you could you contributed to that and if you weren't there because you had to work or you were lucky enough to find a job being a person from Trenchtown then the community would look out after your children most of them didn't have a two-parent home but it was relatively safe it wasn't gang warfare but there were neighborhoods and uh, they had their strong men but you could pretty much go around most of the streets in that part of town in Western Kingston. Yeah, I grew up right in Trenchtown there, man. Monks Martin, my plan on me and Bob Marley, Peter Tosh, Bonnie Wailers, Alton Ellis, Lassell Perkins, Artens Ellis, Stranger Cole, Delroy Wilson, Bonnie and Scully. You know, I could name them. Ha, na, 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 na. Long, 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 long list. I used to go down there now to meet these guys, to get some vibes to see. All these guys live, and when I realized these guys were like presidents in the ghetto, they were respected by everyone. All the youths them used to love their tunes, they used to love toots, just being as a musician. And I said, sure, I love music and want to sing. I said, I want to be like these musicians. I want to be loved by the people. I gotta to sing too, and I get involved in the family. Uh, Trench was like a university for the musicians and the singers. You had to be coming through the trench town because all of them coming from the ghetto also. That's where Rasta come from. You 
they don't really look to it where reggae music really start from start from the ghetto you know back in the days you have about 10 15 20 man from the ghetto trench town that were playing reggae music you see so it's really coming from the ghetto so it must be the cry of the people you know even in slavery when the people used to work they used to sing songs of redemption and freedom so it's them same sound they're going on right now that sound from the used to sing you know them time they when the slave master beat you the whip and everybody have to sing and say carry this heavy load and all them things there, eh? it's the same thing going on right now. This music started out of crying out, of this struggling around here, man. We're not singing no nice, nice music to play on your nice, nice radio. We're suffering, hard time pressure. Bob Lennon put on the pressure, you know what I mean? Bob Marley, J. Lowe's, because them start off as the American music to you, trying to be American first, you know. But the struggle and what we see around us, we couldn't be singing. We don't want to sing that no more. It took me like 15 years for me to start singing before I could sing a tune about a girl. I never saw the relevance of it in the struggle that I was in. When Rasta have to step in the music is when we see that the opportunity was there and they used it for the wrong purpose. And what of great need to be said, nobody was really willing, ready, and able to say so. And I thought I and I have something to say. Like myself and brothers like Bob Marley, too, that can call our music. Rebel music. Yeah. My days of playing music and young spring youth, yeah, I play rebel music. It was an outlaw music. They say it was the music of the dregs, of the ghetto. And worse again, it was Rasta coming with certain messages and then in it. So usually have the rude boy reggae, which was different. And then Rasta came and showed them, said, listen, we don't have to use the guns to fight our battle. We use the music and the lyrics. So the drum and the bass would be like the guns and the lyrics would be our bullets. So that is how it goes. Because we're here to mash down all oppressors. And we're not partial about that. It no matter who. By my mother, she oppressed her fire bun. And my father, my oppressed her fire bun. Because that's what Rasta is about. No partial. Equal rights and justice for all. Everyone is crying out for peace. Yeah. None is crying out for justice. Everyone is crying out for peace, yeah. None is crying out for justice. I don't want no peace. I need equal rights and justice. As the music became entwined inseparably with the spreading of the doctrine, it was forced to readapt to the outside world, which is one of the gifts of, of Rasta because it is eminently adaptable, just as the bare framework of roots reggae has the capaciousness to accept all these different elements into it, Afro-pop or bossa nova, or a little bit of ska and soca but still reggae so the philosophy allowed in this in the 80s especially after the era of bob and the first wave reggae artists made their initial penetration on the normandy beaches of north and south america and europe um, now you had a mostly white audience and in 1979 bob marley was asked in cleveland how he would feel if he came back next year and found the audience was filled with white kids with dreadlocks. And you know what Bob said? Great, man. Me feel great. So I've taken that as my answer when Bob was faced with that. A lot of people will get into the rhythm. Not everybody will follow the, the doctrine or whatever the doctrine happens to be between I and I. And others will eschew the Rasta element, but it's still carrying that reggae vibration of 
being positive and constructive, of always speaking in a positive way, of changing syllables and words into their positive counterparts so that you don't create any evil, because the word sound is the power of creation. So it's like the most ancient of esoteric beliefs, dressed in a, a slightly new garb with groovy music. Watch your hands move. It's your own eyes we've seen. So won't you judge your actions to make sure the results are true? It's your own conscience that is going to remind you that it's your heart and nobody else's that is going to judge. Be not selfish in your doing. Pass it on. your brothers in their knees pass it on we are undiluted soldiers musically we don't take no bribe and we don't water down with music to no one at all whether you show or you poor, whatever you want to be, when it comes to my music, it's straight down the line. The music is for the people, them, you know. The music is for the people, them. So we don't have nothing to hide when it comes to the music, because the music is the way we have jam. Right? That's the people's transportation, you know. People have, have been pushed aside and trampled over, you know. So we place what we know in the music for the people, them, not for the wicked. It's for the people, them. When you come to a Congress concert, remember, you're coming to a church. A church with musical vibes, musical revival. Yeah, for music is life. When the food gone out and the light went out, all we got is on the music. You see? For music is life. Yeah, man. It's going to heal the world in due season, you know? Because time is the master of all things. So the reggae music come like a giant. The truth and right. It's in the words. Teach the children. Teach the people. That's why right now in the society, in the singing world, they prefer when they sing truth and right, that the children can grow up on that. Reggae is a positive vibes, positive, no negative vibes is in a reggae. A reggae have a message, great message. And the message that it has is for you and I, people together. Rasta is for everyone, and the music is for everyone. Reggae music has to be the music, because it's the king music. And as Marley said, this music is going to be playing at the four corners of the earth. It's so easy, it's so simple. It reaches you so quick. This is reggae music. This is God music. And it can only get greater and greater. But that's what we talk about, you know. That's all our music we talk about. Help for the people. Destruction for the wicked. And big up the king every time. Music is central to the story of the spread of a philosophy. I wonder if that's ever been true of any other form. Because the music comes first for most people outside Jamaica. And then it's the discovery of what music is void by. So we now have to deal with what is good. Because God is love. And love is the cohesive force that binds all events to make life purposeful for man to keep on living. This is no toast. This is for real. Let it be there full and free. Let the bloodline of my music flow between generations. Let it soak the earth. Because the earth shall never run dry of cultural music. Because I was already born. It all begins from being yourself and not want to be somebody else. No matter how old you are, as long as it takes you, just be what you want to be. Be somebody great. Be somebody important to people. In all you're getting, get knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. 
make love your conviction because through love all things are possible we just have to try to keep a healthy heart and keep clean for each other and love each other as much as we can we need to focus people on you know it's love 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 peace peace blessings beautiful miracles brighter days this is a real world we can make it be a better world just love thy neighbor as I said. No division, no, you know, divide. Love and respect together. We just need the unity. That's the key. Only that can really conquer the devil. Unity between man and man and sister and sister. Unity. If we don't have that, we'll be forever in the back. Many of us at times get all misled in life. You know, we are not perfect. The last time. And like I said, we all learn from our brother, from our each other. You only feel at the beauty that I like. You only feel, clean hands and pure in heart. Keep on to the good thing and have faith and have tolerance. Get rid of all the false pride and get rid of the material things out of our head. You know, start dealing with humanity. Start dealing with each other as one, regardless of the color, class, or creed. You know, we want that oneness. As Jimmy Phillips said, oneness. You know, it gotta be oneness, one love, one heart, one him, one destiny, peace and love. Keep holding that faith of righteousness, so we keep on holding on to that. See, Rasta is not a religion. Rasta is love, you know? Rasta is one movement. Rasta is what I think everybody going to come to realize, to unite the world. Live a Rasta liberty, which is to treat everyone the way you want to be treated and to try to show love in every situation you can and harm no one, but you can't let anybody harm you either. So you must take a firm stand and, and trust in your heart. And that's what Rasta really is. It's heart of coconut religion. It's not a religion, it's a, it's a, uh, a way of life. And reggae is the soundtrack to the movement of Jai people. You'll get His Majesty completely alone on one channel and the UN translator alone on the other, and you can do whatever you want with it afterwards. So here is His Majesty's address to the United Nations General Assembly. On the question of racial discrimination, the Addis Ababa Conference taught to those who will learn this further lesson that until the philosophy which holds one race superior and another inferior is finally and permanently discredited and abandoned, until there are no longer first-class and second-class citizens of any nature, that until the color of a man's skin is of no more significance than the color of his eyes, that until the basic human rights are equally guaranteed to all without regard to race, that until that day, the dream of lasting peace and world citizenship and the rule of international morality will remain but a fleeting illusion to be pursued but never attained. And until the ignoble and unhappy regimes that hold our brothers in Angola, in Mozambique, and in South Africa in subhuman bondage have been toppled and destroyed, until bigotry and prejudice, malicious and inhuman self-interest have been replaced by understanding and tolerance and goodwill, until all Africans stand up and speak as free human beings, equal in the eyes of all men, as they are in the eyes of heaven, until that day, the African continent will not know peace. We Africans will fight if necessary, and we know that we shall win as we're confident in the victory of good over evil.